from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. Thanks for downloading the podcast. My real name is Rob Snow White, and this is the 10th year of my fly fishing podcast. This is episode 241. In this episode, I talk with Kesley Gallagher. We'll discuss everything from her favorite species to target on both coasts, what to leave behind on a bone fishing trip, and the mojo of eating a turkey sandwich on a boat. We're also going to hear about posing with rods on shoulders. This episode is brought to you by my favorite thing, Traeger. Traeger's goal is to continually innovate with an ambition to make outdoor cooking easier and better tasting. They'll help you spend less time tending to the grill and more time bringing family and friends together, creating a more flavorful world. I'm now a master at cooking brisket. I did it once. I followed the directions on the app and that was it. I was checking the temperature while I was on the boat with my phone. My first time, there was a perfect smoke ring around that delicious hunk of meat. If you like to eat, you'll want to get a Traeger. It is that simple. I cannot wait to make jalapeno poppers with my new jalapeno rack. Pick up all flavors of wood pellets at your local Ace Hardware. Traeger.com. We have with us Kesley Gallagher. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Rob. And how great many, to hear from you. How many people call you Kelsey? Everybody. Everybody yeah. starts with Kelsey, and I laugh because I, I blame my parents that they cursed me at a young age with my name. So <laughs> I'm always telling people, no, it's actually Kesley. Kesley. And they say, are you sure? Because then they say, I think you misspelled your own name. I'm like, no, really, I didn't. <laughs> it's the, actually Kesley. And Who's your celebrity doppelganger for patrons to listen to tonight and, and hear you and who could they picture? My celebrity doppelganger? Um, gosh, who's that woman in um, uh, Atomic Blonde? Atomic Blonde. <laughs> I think that was Atomic Blonde. I think that's Charlize my Theron? doppelganger. Yeah. All right. She kicks, she kicks ass in that movie and I just yes. love watching it. Is that the one that's in Germany? Yes, in Berlin. Yeah, that was a cool movie. I dug that. Yeah, yeah. And where are we checking in with you today? I'm in Los Angeles, California, actually just north of it, um, in a place called Westlake Village. And if you go across the hills, you'll be in Malibu. So I'm about, I'd say, 10 miles from the ocean. Okay. In the Pacific, yeah. All right. That's two yeah. podcasts in a row with people from Los Angeles. Oh, really? Who was the last one? Zane Lamprey. Okay. <laughs> you may see him walking an enormous Irish wolfhound in Los Angeles. Uh, I may have seen him already. There I will you. look for that. All right. <laughs> so, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you were not born here in the States. No, I was, I was born in Perth, Australia. My father actually worked for the State Department, and I grew up much of my life in Washington, D.C. Right, so you were out here. Where- where yeah. were you specifically out here? I um, I grew up in Chevy Chase uh, in a place called Kenwood, and then also in Old Town Alexandria for part of my life. Yeah, just and then another school. part was I grew up in Florida and went to school in Maine and then moved to California. And your dad's the one who got you all into this. How, how old yes. were you when you became an angler? <laughs> well, um, I don't actually remember the first fish I caught. It seemed like I was always fishing. But I do remember going into Shenandoah National Park with him and watching him, you know, fish for brook trout, I mean, miniature trout in creeks. And I thought, it can't be this hard. There's no way it's this hard. Um, But then I really got introduced to Western style of fly fishing, you know, dry fly, big casts in Montana and Glacier National Park by my stepfather. And he grew up fly fishing in Montana. So it was, you know, very, it was very distinguished between Eastern fly fishing, where you really have to watch out for trees and yes. brush, <laughs> versus Montana, where you have room to cast. So it was interesting. I spent a lot of time untangling and pulling flies out of trees. 
Exactly. I think any East Coast angler knows that. It's like short rods, and you get very good at untangling your fly. I took some friends out last week, and Mm -hmm. as we were pulling out of the the boat ride, I was hoping you know these guys. They do know I'm not untangling their lines for them today. (laughs) I I didn't make that clear, but I I assumed that I was not going to be unknotting their their rigs. Right. Right. So, what brought you to California? Well, um, when I graduated from Bowdoin College in Maine, my boyfriend at the time said, let's move to Laguna Beach. And I thought, well, I have nothing to lose and and all, anything to gain. And I loved L.A., so I moved with him. And the funny thing is, we got to Laguna Beach, and I thought, I have made it big because it's beautiful here. I love it. And he looked at me and said, I don't like it here. I said, well, too bad. I'm staying. You can go. <laughs> So from then on, I just stayed in Orange County, um, got a job, and then just progressed from there. So I've actually been in L.A. now for about 25 years. Has it changed much for the better? No, I'd say that there's just there's a lot more people, especially in Orange County. And I've just moved north. I work at Amgen, uh, which is in Thousand Oaks, which is an hour north of LAX. And there are less people up here. And um, I... I back up to the Santa Monica Mountains, which is a national um, national preserve and forest. So there's actually a lot of fishing in the Malibu Creek area and then out in the ocean. So Malibu so, Creek empties in at that lagoon yeah. with the bridge. Yes. I got skunk yes. there. But it was gorgeous. <laughs> yes. And the grunion that live in the – people go collect grunion. the grunion. Yeah, grunion, halibut, corbina. We have um, yellowfin croaker sometimes. And then in the summer right now, um, we're getting uh, yellowtail, which is a California yellow- yellowtail. It's a type of jack. And then yellowfin tuna, they're pushing up from San Diego. So right now is the time to go offshore for pelagics. And in historically, the, uh, the um, albacore tuna would also come up from San Diego, and um, you'd be able to fish for them out here as well. Is that they're following like squid migrations or sardines? What's what's bringing them I, north? I, th- I think it is the sardines. Um, in the winter, you get a lot more squid. I could be wrong, but that's and you get a lot of white sea bass as well in the winter. Although they're very difficult to catch on fly, but the conventional uh, anglers seem to catch them quite often. And I don't want to start on a sad note, but how far are you from the scuba diving boat fire from over the weekend? Well, um, it was out in Santa Cruz Island, which is the the, uh, Channel Islands. So they're just offshore, and we've actually taken that trek quite a few times, not to dive, but go hike on the island. And um, it's been all over the local news, and it's it's terrible to think that these people were trapped in the hull of the boat and just burned to death. Yeah, it's it's a pretty bad way to go. Yeah, it's horrible. Scared beyond. Oh, it's I about know. As scary could get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no way out. I couldn't. I can't even imagine. All right. Well, let's break down. While we're on the California topic, let's break down some of those fish. So people think halibut, and they think Alaska, things that are the size of a dinner table. But you can <laughs> wade out just a couple of feet where you are. I fished Long Beach, and mm-hmm. you can just you know fish from where the the little yeah. waves are crashing, and there's a little halibut right there. Yeah, our California halibut. Uh, I think they get up to forty pounds. If you're a little bit offshore, but they're fairly common in the surf zone and especially in the bay around Long Beach. Um, You know, when I was learning how to really um, like cast distance, I'd go every weekend to Long Beach in that bay and just start, you know, fishing for halibut. And you come up sometimes with 40 fish a day. I mean, they're not big necessarily, but you definitely get into them and you really get your 80 80 foot cast in. (laughs) So, and you also get used to, you know, um, managing the waves and also how to fight fish in the surf. But they're a lot of fun. You know, you use like a, like a one odd or a size one or two clouser, olive and white, and just cast out. And you, you're pretty sure you're going to get them out there. And I know a friend of mine, he, he got world records on halibut up to 20 pounds casting in the surf. That'd be fun. So they are, <laughs> no, right? Yeah, the ones yeah. I caught were like the size of a jumbo slice of pizza on Adams Morgan for the local <laughs> people. I, I, I think jumbo slice was was after you left. <laughs> but yeah, the largest halibut I've caught on the fly out there is about ten pounds, and that that will take you. And then fighting them in the waves is is another it's experience. It's gonna be awkward entirely, <laughs> it is. especially when the waves are crashing over your head. 
and you can't get you know, the line. The line's going everywhere, and the fish is going berserk. So it's fun, really. <laughs> nice. And tell us, you know, for people that haven't heard, Corbino, what I called it was, it's like the love child of a, a carp and a redfish that lives on the West Coast. <laughs> I think the best description, and especially for your listeners in the southeast, um, it's a type of croaker. It looks like whiting, a very large whiting. I think the all-time record is seven pounds. So imagine a seven-pound whiting coming in and out of the surf. We usually get our corbina come into the surf to feed on sand crabs between, I'd say, Memorial Day and Labor Day. So it's a summer fish, and they're fairly common on our beaches anywhere from San Diego up to Santa Barbara. So the first one I caught was in Long Beach in February, and it was enormous. Uh, Really? I didn't know what it was. I had a digital camera (laughs) back then. I took a picture, and I was at Bob Marriott's, Uh and I showed on my screen. I said, what is that? And the dude's like... He's like, you caught that? I'm like, yeah. What, what is? He's like, you just caught that right now. I'm like, yeah. I'm from Virginia. I don't know. what He goes, but well, you've never fished out here, and that was your first fish. I'm like, what is it, dude? Mm-hmm. It was a corbina that was 26 inches long, 27. That's a big one. That's a nice one. I had no idea, and the guy was pissed because he'd been trying for something like that, and I just come out with beginner's luck. Mm-hmm. I no, one. I mean, the the. The corbina in that in that bay area that you were, because um, I know exactly where you were, they're residents, and you can catch them on like clouser minnows, like a size six, um, a size four clouser, and they're really they also feed on the grunion. So when the grunion you're in, you can always fish. You can you're looking for halibut mostly, but you will get the occasional corbina. My first record was a corbina out of Long Beach on a clouser, which was very surprising, and it was also in early March. So that's what they, I mean, in the winter, they're trying to, you know, keep fat, keep the energy going. So they're going to eat about anything. So am I. (laughs) Yeah, right. They think that theoretically that's what large Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners were a month apart to fatten Uh up between months (laughs) to, uh, you know, keep you warm throughout the winter. Uh That's one theory I read. I didn't know that. Uh, So what are you looking for when you're going Corbina fishing? I, I assume the... There's not much structure there. Are you blind casting? Are you looking for tails? Well, what I do um, in the summer months, if you are going um, corbina fishing in the surf in the summer, I usually, you know, at first I always look at my tides. And I um, like fishing early in the morning, like the crack of dawn. I'll look for a deep negative tide, you know, like a new moon. And what you're looking for are the fish coming up from the trough and then sliding in with the wave to pick on the sand crabs. And you can always tell the sand crabs because the sand looks a little uh, rough, and that's where where they would have a bed of sand crabs. So the corbina slide up on the wave, you know, grab a sand crab or whatever, and then slide back with the wave. So in the early dawn, you're looking for backs because those fish, kind of like a redfish being croaker, will have a back out of the water, and they're designed to slide up in the waves and then slide back. And so you're looking for wakes, backs, tails. Sometimes you'll see the tail because they're, they've are they got a sand crabs and they're digging in that sand as fast as they can before they run out of water. And then um, as the sun rises and the fog lifts, um, you are going to be looking for the fish themselves. And as the tide comes in, the troughs will fill up and then they'll hold in those troughs. And like this summer in Santa Monica Beach, just south of the pier, I was picking out troughs where the waves had dug out a hole, essentially, almost a hole about four feet deep. And there were fish holding in that hole because they had water between wave sets. So you're looking for backs, tails, and then the actual fish when the sun is high. How long can you repeatedly go to a spot like that hole before it fills in and then you got to go find another spot? Do they last for a while? Do you have a storm that will ruin it? Yeah, storms... um, Right now, there haven't been a lot of storms or high surf, so the beaches are actually pretty flat, and that's that's not that's difficult for me anyway um, when I'm corbina fishing because you want um, you want troughs and holes in the beach so you can figure out where the fish are going to hold. We're always looking for rip currents because those rips will cut a trough in the sand. So it depends. Like we had a good holes and troughs for about. I'd say three weeks at this one spot. But when we came back after um, some time, it was completely flat and the troughs were gone. 
So it depends. You should always have a backup plan, like plan A, plan B uh, on these beaches. What would I have been hooking at Leo Carrillo Beach that kept breaking my line? <laughs> That's a good question. I was you using been... flat, whitish looking turnf crabs. Okay. Everything broke them all. I ran out of them. Okay. The Corbina probably... have got a soft mouth. Halibut yes. have got a couple little teeth. Mm-hmm. I would say you're probably hooking into Leo or leopard sharks. We call them Leos. And those guys eat crabs, eat clams, um, and they would certainly take a crab and then tear, you know, tear through the, the tippet or leader and probably put, your, put you in your backing pretty fast. That's pretty cool. I may have hooked a leopard shark. Yeah. And, I mean, the, if you are fishing with a light tippet, of course, you could, I mean, people can argue with me, but it's been my experience that, well, granted, I'm thinking of tarpon, but the, the leader itself can wear through especially if you're holding on tight and that's over their skin. Cool. What's your, <laughs> what's your typical sort of LA leader rod line rig well, that you're going to outfit yourself with? I, um, I, granted, I, it depends on the species I'm targeting. You know, if some days we get like, we want to challenge ourselves here in LA and then like, we'll say in 24 hours, you have to catch three species of fish. And usually that's Corbina, Calico bass and carp. And obviously, those three are very different fish. You're going to find calicos out in the breakwater out in Long Beach Harbor. Um, so you're going to be using a like a nine weight with a very fast sinking line, probably about 400 grains. And that's going to be a fast sink. And then for Corbina, you're using about a 300 grain line anywhere from a, you're like a salty five weight. And I use a salty six weight. And then uh, for carp, I'm using a seven weight floating line with the indicator is that in the so, la river where yeah Terminator and, then, and, and uh yeah yeah and everything else was filmed greece yes i think a, a view and, with rihanna and uh, uh what's that guy uh, john remember. travolta and and uh that's more my my generation <laughs> the john travolta olivia newton john greece when they're in the river you know way back in the 70s and there's been a lot of articles written recently about quote unquote trash fish in the LA River. It's yes. just as urban as a place out here, but it's made of concrete. Well, um, okay, I'll give you some history. Ooh. Where we fish for the LA River carp is actually riparian, or it's the natural river bottom. A lot of people don't realize this, but LA was not always concrete, it was actually a, a beautiful marsh with a lot of wetlands. And when there was used to be a lot of snow on those mountains, and obviously when the snow melted, it would run to the ocean and collect in marshes. So those rivers, like the Santa Ana River, L.A. River, Topanga, and Malibu, they, um, they would all have steelhead and salmon in them. The Santa Ana River historically was a fabulous steelhead and salmon river. So when the L.A. Corps of Engineers um, started paving over the river in response to flooding in Los Angeles, there was one part, and that um, is near Atwater Village and, and Griffin Park, Griffith Park. They couldn't pave it over because it has natural springs. So it's actually a natural bottom, like boulders and trees. <laughs> and the, when the Chinese, I guess, laborers came to L.A., they put carp in the river so they would always have a food source. So it's very historic um, where we do fish, and it's not all concrete either. Like our fish were put in the Potomac to feed all the mangled Civil War soldiers after the war. Yeah, they, yeah. They couldn't go home because they didn't have any limbs. And yeah. they stuck around here and farmed, and mm -hmm. that's where we got our mm -hmm. bass and carp from. Yeah. It's kind of crazy when you start tracing back the history of the U.S. and why they put fish where they did. Uh, and then you understand that carp were actually put throughout the United States to actually feed people. And they had no idea what was going to happen to those carp. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> exactly. All right. So anything else about California before I go to some other your favorite destinations? What's um, your what's your home fly shop out there? Uh, right now it's Fisherman's Spot and also Bob Marriott's fly shop. Um, Bob Marriott's has got huge selection for fly tying material. It's like a smorgasbord for me. I, I have to make a huge list of all the flies I want to tie in a year and just start, you know, buying because even when I make a list, I go there, I'm like, oh, my God, I never thought about this, <laughs> and start buying. 
Um, and, you know, lo- Fisherman Spot's great because it's local and you can always trade stories. But, yeah, those are my two shops. Where are you going out for breakfast after one of those early mornings? And where are you going out to eat after? <laughs> I, um, let's see, when we do LA river carp fishing, um, usually we have breakfast before, but breakfast for burritos. lunch there's, yeah, basically, um, for, well, for the guys, I'm, you know, one of those breakfast bar types. So I always pack something with me to eat while I'm fishing, but usually after like two o'clock, 2 PM, I'm ravenous. So we always have this favorite Vietnamese restaurant that's right by the river And when I was teaching myself how to carp fish, I would say, okay, you can't go and have pho until you've caught a carp. And some days I get it at 11 and the waitress would go, oh, you were successful early. I'm like, yeah. And then I get there some days at three. And she's like, not good fishing, huh? I'm like, no, I need to eat now, please. (laughs) And what about Sizzler? Do people still go there? Because there's no Sizzlers here. And when we were in LA, I kept telling my wife, I'm like, there's a Sizzler. We got to go for nostalgia. Really? And she's like, oh, no, we're going to Jelena. <laughs> and I'm like, Sizzler. I I have I have to be honest. I've never frequented a Sizzler, a Sizzler out here. I frequent the taco shops, you know, that sort of thing. The and then Choi we Chai have tacos. Exactly. Like the Korean tacos and the and the food trucks that you can monitor on your an app here in L.A. Because that's where the real and I don't the fusion cuisine really happens. So. You should call them and be like, hey, we're carp fishing. Can you guys roll up? I know, right? <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so let's do Louisiana. Okay. What is it about those marshes that interest you so much? You got a well, lot of variety in California, but you go down to the, the marshes. Well, I haven't been for a while, but I remember in the fly fishing film tour, seeing those giant redfish on, this, on the big screen with Greg Denny. And he's trying to go for a two-pound record with, I don't know, like a 30-pound fish. And I thought, holy crap. You know, I grew up part of my life near Mosquito Lagoon, and I've never seen redfish that big. So I told my friend, I said, we have to go. We have to fish this. And so that's what happened. You know, I started going that year. And that, that first time we went, it was terrible weather. And the last day we had all these clouds and wind and we couldn't see the fish, but Greg has those eyes and he was able to see the fish. And we pulled in a 27 pound red and he's like, you know, that's close to the woman's record at the time. And then I was hooked one on big redfish and two like, you know, seeking records because it was so thrilling to think that, you know, I could actually do this. So I went back every year to get the women's record. And I finally got it, but, you know, a few, like a year later, I think Meredith McCord took it back. Well, so, so. we'll have to have another talk <laughs> with her about that, <laughs> poaching other people's records. So how many I are know. you up to now? Is, uh, can you count them on all your fingers and toes? Um, fingers do- and toes. Yeah. I'm up to t- 12 now. I mean, granted, a lot have been broken or the IGFA has taken them back because they've made the rules stricter. But I just recently got two records on the L.A. River for CARP. And we're trying, I want to break them again, but on much larger carp out of Lake Michigan. So we're looking at going up there to look for the 20 and 30 pound carp to really break the records. And if you were polydactylous, you could count them on one of them. So you're doing (laughs) Beaver Island up in Michigan? We're, we're thinking, my boyfriend and I are thinking about that. Um, he's a, I guess he's a rod, he's a technical advisor to TFO. So he was, he'd never been uh, carp fishing before. And we took him on the LA river and then he saw me pull those two giants out. And then he started talking up carp fishing in LA. And this guy's like, those are nothing. You have to come up here. And he's like, oh, okay. So, I, I you know, I yeah. I met him before. He was a, a former team member, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Thought Scott so. Leon. Yeah, he used to he used to be the chief editor of Fly Fishing and Salt Waters, so he's been throughout Florida, but okay. then he came out west. What else about the marsh? Is it just trying to get some big donkey on on a gurgler, yeah. popping bug? Does it matter to you what you catch it on, or are you just straight up well, going? i the size oh, on when that I, tippet. When I go out there, I'm going for you know the big fish, so I'm targeting December, January when it's cold. Because that's, you know, the marshes clear up, number one. Two, it's cold, and the big fish come in, you know, closer to shore, and then they also rise up. So it's easier because they're trying to warm up in the sunshine, so they're easier to spot. Um, So that's why I target it. And plus, it's empty. 
you know, not a lot of crazy people want to go out there when it's super cold, but that's when we go. Where do you fly into when you're going down there? I, I fly into New Orleans and usually hang out in the, in the, um, the Garden District because, one, it's cheaper and I don't need to deal with the French Quarter. And then I usually meet Greg Denny and then we go to Chalmette and then go out into the bayou. So it was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, that's also the same time as Mardi Gras. So <laughs> it'd be like, get your dinner, go to a parade, get your beads, and then go fishing the next day. <laughs> I don't really have any interest in being down there at a Mardi Gras. I'm over that. <laughs> yeah, I got over it real fast when we couldn't negotiate traffic, but it's still fun. No, uh, so Zane Lamprey is going to suggest you may or may not go to Fred's Bar near LSU oh. for the, the Cracky Sack <laughs> drink. You have to listen to the last pa- podcast to find out what a Cracky I w- Sack is. I will definitely do that. Yeah. And... Any particular rod reel line leader outfit? And how do you verify Um, that you're doing all GFA? Okay. So um, what I do, you bring a 9 and 10 weight. And Rio makes a nice red uh, winter redfish line. And that's what I usually use because most of the redfish lines that are designed today, are they have a tropic core. But when you're in the cold wind, and sometimes when we're out there in the morning, it's going to be in the 30s. So you want a cold, like a winter core so that you can actually get the cast in and not have the line too stiff. So that's what we'll use. And it does get windy. Um, so you want to bring the 10 weight so you can punch through the wind if needed. But most of the time I'm fishing a 9 weight. And for IGFA, my, my, uh, my master's degree is in regulation. So <laughs> I make sure I know all the regs before I go out. And the key thing to breaking any record is making sure you have a calibrated weighing device. And I use BOGA, a BOGA grip, and make sure it's calibrated by IGFA. So you ship it and, to them, they certify it, ship it back? Yeah, that's right. And make sure, you know, luck favors the prepared. So if you know you have a calibrated scale, with you, then you know that you've got an advantage because that uh, that is a precise weight. And also, when you land, say, a big redfish like that, you can't weigh the fish on the boat. You have to go on land and then weigh it. So that's another key thing. And another hint is always take a picture of you weighing the fish on land so they don't question how you did it. What also, if you're bring really far from land. Do you have to live well it, drag it? Do you have like a you... a bottle of water you just keep pumping in its face? <laughs> Well, a lot of people will, if the fish is small enough, they will live well the fish and then bring it to land, weigh it, and then release it. And now, granted, um, for me, my limit is 60 pounds because that's the largest boga grip that boga makes. Otherwise, you're going to have to kill the fish. But I know there are other ways of doing this, and I'm sure many of your listeners would have the, you know, the hints on doing that, but I limit myself to 60 pounds. Um, theoretically all you have to do is have a, a tub large enough with water mm-hmm. put a fish in it and then measure the you know eureka moment do you calculate <laughs> what it weighed the displacement well well yeah i don't know if igfa accepts that i think that they do um just the the calibrated um scale but again there are all types of ways of measuring the volume of the fish and uh, and understanding the weight of the fish Will you only target the big fish, or are you going to have some fun if you see something else swimming around? My we are, my boyfriend has opened my eyes to other things that we could start doing. He wants to go down to Columbia to go for um, the yellowfin tuna and then also fish some of the rigs um, outside of uh, Venice, Louisiana, you know, for blackfin tuna. There's a crazy so all... picture of Ross Purnell from a couple years ago on a boat with a tuna. And then the uh-huh. flames shooting out of the top of the <laughs> the rigs. Uh-huh. It's a really cool shot. You got to do that. Yeah, awesome. yeah, no, I want to because his stories about even fighting marlin around one of those rigs is, is crazy. And it sounds like a lot of fun. But, you know, I also like targeting species around Los Angeles because L.A. is a great fishery. And so is San Diego. And not a lot of people in the U.S. realize that, that, you know, Southern California is a and historically has been an amazing fishery. So that's why I like doing what I do, you know, almost within the city limits to say, you know, we do have good fishing here. And is there a big population of fly anglers? Do you bump into regulars? Uh-huh. 
We do have a lot. There are a lot of fly fishing clubs here in Southern California and throughout California. And so, you know, so the club, you know, the club mentality, people get together to trade stories. I was actually on a, a fly fishing presentation tour, so to speak, throughout a few clubs here in Southern California this summer, just speaking about flats fishing. A lot of the anglers out west, they, you know, they fly, they angle for trout and not necessarily offshore pelagics or even inshore. So it's just, you know, opening up the mind and saying, you know, fly fishing just isn't for trout and you've got a lot offshore that you can take advantage of. Um, I think you probably run into the same thing when you start talking about fishing the Potomac and the Chesapeake. You know, it's not just small brook trout anymore. Right. That's why we founded our fishing club is fish for whatever's right. local. Be exactly. Introduce tilapia or brook trout that swim down from the mountains. You never know <laughs> what you're get, getting. Yeah, exactly. And I love the picture of you in front of the Jefferson Memorial yeah. with a carp. That's something I wanted to do. I just put that, some of those on the front page of the new Tidal Potomac Fly Riders website, which I'm redoing. Uh -huh. now, I'm, cool. now I'm doing three websites at once. It's a busy man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is a fly that you could use in both LA and in the salt marshes of Louisiana? Oh, geez. Um, there is a fly that I that um, I use that's actually created by my guide in the um, in the Keys, Luis Cortez, and it's um, like it's tied. It's spun deer hair with two schlappen feathers out behind it. And usually you have it in brown, black, or even chartreuse. And I use that actually for bass out here. I've used it for catfish in those in these lakes. And then you could also use it, you know, larger or smaller for redfish out in the marsh. Sounds like an old uh, mangrove muddler. Exactly. And I call it the mangrove mouse, you know, because that's what it looks like to me. It looks like a mouse, but it's actually, it's actually subsurface because of the water that's soaked in by the deer hair. And they also put some bead chain and it'll just sink just below the surface. And if you fish it with an intermediate sink line, it's very effective because it, it pushes water and it wiggles. So yeah. the, the bass can't get enough of it. Well, let's transition now. You mentioned Florida. So you also do some flats fishing. Your online moniker is Steely Chick. And we haven't even gotten close to steelhead yet. <laughs> so let's talk about some tarpon and bonefish. Sure. What is it about those that intrigues you to fly from L.A. to the Caribbean? Yeah, I, and funny you mentioned that because I just got back from Belize. Um, I love tarpon because, one, they challenged me like no other fish. They're, you know, when I talk to people, oh, you can practice for bonefish by carp. You can practice for permit with corbina. But I can't – I don't have a fish you can practice on for tarpon. I mean, the fight is like a, a tuna. They're going to test all the muscle in your body, but they're also on a flat, so they're running. You've got to chase them. And then when you enter in the, tar the tournament rules, you have to leader the fish, you know, do a face grab. And not only that, the fish are huge, and they, they'll, they'll play possum on you, so you've always got to be on your toes to see what they're going to try next. They're unlike any fish I've ever, I've ever had. Would you see you have the mouth? Do you have to grab them by their mouth? Yeah, that's the face grab, and that's how you you With can gloves? demonstrate it. Yeah, oh yeah, because okay. their face, those, that mouth is all sandpaper, and they'll tear up your hands. Oh, that's why I scream like a little girl when I go to Robbie's in Isla Mirada. <laughs> I don't let those things get near me. I drop that fish as soon as that fish <laughs> looks at me. Exactly. Culture like, goodbye. Yeah. No, it was, I was fishing for, you know, uh, tarpon with Greg Denny in Florida and I was skunked for three days. I mean, I jumped one, but we had 20 mile an hour wind off the bow. So you had to cast in the wind and there's just line after line after line of fish coming through. And it just frustrated me so much. I thought I'm giving this sport up. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. Why am I wasting my money? By the time I landed in LA, I was booking my next trip. And from there on out, all I fished for were tarpon because I wasn't going to let this fish beat me. So I went to Costa Rica. I went to Belize. I actually snuck on a work trip to Puerto Rico so I could fish for uh, tarpon before work in the morning. <laughs> and so I became obsessed. Do you have a and tarpon tattoo? Almost. I'm very close. <laughs> but... Um, I love how when they grab you really like your whole body has to fight that fish. And I started weightlifting again for these fish. 
um, and just strengthening my core, everything, just to be able to fight these fish. What kind of it's, workout do you do or, or weightlifting to suggest to others that might want to go start targeting? Well, I have a herniated disc, number yeah. one, so I have to be real careful. But a lot of core exercises, a lot of lifting, like um, doing squats and deadlifts, and then also doing shoulder press as well and bench. I mean, so just the bigger muscles, but also, you know, because you are casting you know, the rotator cuff, you have to be careful of. That sounds so. like a lot of work. I love it. I you're, love you're it. Change your name to Tarpon Chick. <laughs> you well, when I explain Steely Chick, you'll you'll understand more. Okay. It's not just about uh, anadromous trout. All right. We'll get so. <laughs> when you're doing all this travel, are there any travel hacks you've developed just to make it easier? Packing, what to bring, what not to bring, what always yeah. to bring. Well, when I'm always going to the flats, say you know to, to pursue a grand slam or bonefish permit, always bring your wading basket, like the, the stripping basket. A lot of people are like, oh, I would never bring that. Well, you know, there is there is going to be wind on the flats. You're going to need to put 70 feet of line somewhere before you cast. So people laugh at me, but I always bring a stripping basket and I always have wading boots. And they're like, we're just going to be in the boat. And there's so many times where the guide looks at you and said, okay, jump out of the boat and chase that permit. And the guys who or in flip-flops, like, what? And I'm like, putting on my boots, like, I told you so. So always pack those things. And also, I always bring lens cleaner for my sunglasses. Because with the new coatings on, like, Costa and other glasses, you get salt on it, and it'll smear. And you can't wipe it off. So bring some type of alcohol to dry it up and then clean it. Well, I think we're always going to have alcohol. That's yeah, kind of the whole purpose of the last <laughs> podcast. But we yeah. were at... Uh... What bar were my wife and I at? It was the Village Bistro, the Corner Bistro in uh -huh. Greenwich Village. And this woman just kind of takes off her glasses and shakes him at the bartender. And he just goes and grabs a bottle of vodka and pours <laughs> them into a, a towel for her. She cleans her glasses. And she must yeah. have been a regular because there was no verbal anything <laughs> going on. That's funny. But, you know, you got to ask you know, you're not on the ocean getting sprayed in the face. Why do you need to clean your glasses so much? Why are you so dirty? So, yeah, that's funny. I'm always trying to keep food out of my glasses. That's a regular <laughs> conversation. For me, it's just it's salt water spray. Ugh. What are things you should not be bringing? That, something you, the first two trips, you're like, I'll bring in this. And then you're like, third trip, yeah, that was just a total waste. It, oh, that's a great question. Um, I think a six weight rod. <laughs> People are like, oh, you're going to get small bonefish. I'm like, okay, bring a six weight. I've never once used a six weight anywhere in any of my trips. And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I can get away with a five or a six. I'm like, no, leave that at home because people just don't understand the constant breeze you've got to punch through. And even sometimes I'm like, I'm not even going to bring my seven weight. So I just pack an eight through 12. So it's just like keep the smaller tackle at home because you're not going to use it. And if you do, you'll frustrate the hell out of yourself. And Conway Bowman, another Californian, said yes. you shouldn't even not be bringing your flies on these travel destination trips. You should be buying what's tied locally there because they know what the fish eat. Are you going to go yeah, with that? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, if I always say if you're in the United States, say you fish the Keys – don't bring any flies because if you're fishing with a guide, they're just going to take off whatever you tied, including the leader, and tie it on and tie their super special secret fly. And, you know, no questions asked. I've had it so many times where I thought I have tied this beautiful leader and they look at it and take it off. <laughs> and I'm like, I spent hours tying all these leaders. Like, that's not good enough. And then they'll tie on their super secret fly. But when you're overseas, say Belize or Costa Rica or even so yeah, those two, I brought a bunch of flies and even in, especially to Mexico, when we were out at Espiritu Santo Bay Lodge, there are no fly shops within hours. So it is up to you and you do have to do that research and, you know, do as much research as you can. I always uh, say to people, stalk people on Instagram, see where they are, see what flies are using. If you don't know what they're using, ask. There's a lot of ego out there that loves to show off and they'll be more than happy to tell you you know how to tie this fly why it works etc so i do a lot of reconnaissance before i go anywhere very nice 
<laughs> now, what fly would you take to Florida, Louisiana, L.A., and say Belize? Would it still be that same fly? Yeah, as it as that, and um, all, of course, you want to have a gotcha. Um, we have a, a fly that we always take with us to the Keys, and they, they say Andros. It's called the Doctor Fly, and it was developed by a friend of mine. And he has a certain a certain pattern that always works. It looks like a giant gotcha, but I've seen I've seen bonefish come from ten feet away to grab this fly. So that's something I always carry with me. And then, of course, um, a, a purple and black um, EP uh, fish or EP tarpon. I forget the name of it, but it's always a purple and black EP fiber. Peanut butter? Yeah, something like that. Right. I, and a Whistler. And uh, Dan Blanton's Whistler in black and red or black and orange. And then a giant one tied on a four-aught hook. Um, and we call it the Black Mamba. And um, that's that, that fly was actually the fly that worked in my recent trip to Belize. And you use it in cloudier water for big tarpon. All of this, there's one thing in common. This is all sight fishing species, pretty much. Yes. Do you just have really good eyes? Uh, or is that for I the do. guides? I um, have 2015 vision. Ooh. And so as I get older, you obviously, I. <laughs> you can just get to all these places yourself. Exactly. But, you know, now it's the, the close up. So I always I have to bring reading glasses, but you take those off and then I can see very well. But the guy who has the best eyes is Greg Denny. I don't know how he sees these things. Does he have a website where people can go look him up? Yeah, um, Flywater Expeditions. Does he go to the Somerset shows? He might. Um, I know he was at ICAST last year in Orlando. Um, but he, he, he guides the marsh almost exclusively through the winter. And about March to April, then he goes down to the Keys and follows the tarpon up to the panhandle of Florida. And then he takes August off. So after you go fish with him, where's lunch? <laughs> it's on the it's on the marsh. We bring lunch with us. We have turkey subs. We eat there Publix? because he's oh yeah. Well, not Publix in Louisiana, but I think it's Penny's Diner, and she'll make the sandwiches for you. Penny's and you go out, yeah, you go out in the marsh, and usually it's me grabbing a sandwich, and then Greg yelling, "There's a fish over there! Drop the sandwich!" Yeah, that was my client it's, putting oh. sunscreen on. We're sitting there yeah. in the swamp. And <laughs> the snakehead just gingerly is slow going by us. Oh. And I'm like, put down the sunscreen. And he's like, <laughs> no. he's like, no, uh -huh. I want to. And I'm like, put the effing sunscreen. Like I was gonna smack it out of his hand, but that would have scared the fish. <laughs> and by the time right. he was done, it was gone. Yeah. I was like, you blew I mean, it. You really blew that one. Greg and I were fishing um, off of. Uh, I think um, some keys south of Isla Morada, and no fish were showing up. And he looks at me and goes, get a sandwich, eat a sandwich. And I did. And, you know, like magic, they showed up. It was so funny. I don't know what it is, but you eat, start eating a sandwich in a tarpon flat, and they're going to show up. Well, I'm going to start eating sandwiches up here. Maybe we'll get tarpon. I think <laughs> in 10, 15 years, we're going to have gators, crocs, and Yeah, and tarpon you already up have here. gators in Virginia. Yeah, and they're all moving I guess north. They, I guess they found a permit off of Maine this year. Really? So, yeah. Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine fishing, like, off of Portland, Maine for permit and striper? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how a, a northern accent would pronounce permit. Like, a pubit? Pu yeah. I don't even want to think. Havid Pomet. <laughs> yeah. So, what would you do if you weren't an angler? Me? Yeah. What um, would your thing be? crochet gosh no Badminton? gosh i used to be an equestrian i used to train horses every evening um when i lived in orange county and then i had an accident where the horse fell on me and that's where i damaged my back that's so, the disc thing you said you were yeah. a slip disc it's from the horse yeah well it yeah the initial accident um the initial back injury was from the horse and then believe it or not i fell on a boulder wading a creek one day and that tore my disc. And so it's been a battle ever since. And they told me there's no way you're ever going to ride a horse again or run or jog or ski. So I mm. took up fly fishing. And, of course, you know, they think it's a gentle sport. But then no. here I am fighting, fighting tarpon, which I don't think any doctor had in mind. I've covered in cuts and bruises and dents. And 
I'm like, man, I just walk around like urban fisheries. How am I so, my body's so damaged? <laughs> People think it's a simple thing. I'm like, no, one of my no. most physical jobs ever was a cheesemonger. People raised uh-huh. their eyebrows. I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. I mean, cheesemongering was physical and it, it hurt. <laughs> Fishing is just as bad sometimes. Well, yeah, you get like off San Diego this time of year, you're going to get 25 to 30 pound, uh, you know, yellowfin tuna. And you, my boyfriend's always looking for a hundred pound yellowfin tuna on fly. And that's an hour long battle. Not interesting. Oh, no. <laughs> he could listen to this and podcast I, while he's fighting one. Exactly. And I, I said, well, you go find that hundred pound. I'll stick to 30. Cause that was painful enough. I know when Greg told me a story, he, he fought um, on a 16 weight rod, a 96 pound yellowfin tuna off Venice and he said it took an hour, and he said he was begging people to cut the line because he said it was the worst experience he's ever had because it was so painful. Yeah, I just don't want that feeling of the, everything just burning, the muscles, right. the fatigue. Right, That's, you're just dying. <laughs> yeah, I could just have my neighbor just punch me in the face if I want to feel pain. Or, yeah, or just, you know, constantly body slam you. Yeah, no. <laughs> I need to be able to get up in the morning and roll out of bed and not be hurting. I imagine yeah. fighting a fish that long. You're going to get some calf cramps at night. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I, when I was on my tarpon learning, you know, swore, you know, my tarpon learning PhD sort of thing, I went to Costa Rica to Tarponville. And I thought, oh, we'll be catching 60 to 70 pound par- tarpon. No, every fish we caught was over 100 pounds. And that was a guaranteed 40 minute fight every single day, twice. So, yeah, I got used to the pain of, you know, the pain of pulling these fish in. <laughs> is there an award for catching a tarpon that weighs what you do? I don't think so, but I think that would be a good one. I think I'll, you know, say, you know, the ladies tarpon tournament, you know, if you catch the fish that's your weight, you'll get an extra award. No <laughs> one's going to say a... what the fish weighs. <laughs> no, but I think that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. You, or maybe by length, you know, if you catch a fish that's five foot seven. That sort of thing. All right. Oh, you mentioned yeah. the Bahamas earlier. You've been following, obviously, the, the news. Yes. Um, as an angler who's been down there, do you think it's all just totally gone for some time? Well, you, the northern islands, yes. I mean, you look at all the damage. It's, you know, there. I put a video up on Facebook of this guy who's obviously built his mansion or, you know, Bahamian Fort Knox, so to speak. And he was 20 feet up in the air, and the waves were crashing around his windows. Oh, my God. And this guy is obviously a multimillionaire because he was able to view the storm through the storm windows and just all of this devastation and flooding all around him. And I thought, that house is taking a beating. What about the people who don't have that kind of construction? They're obviously being washed away. And even if you survived in, say, that type of house, the Fort Knox, there's no community around you there's, afterwards. There's nowhere to eat. There's, there's nowhere to drink. There's no there's, power there's, for who knows. No, there's nothing. And so it's complete devastation. Um, when you looked at Hurricane Irma or Maria, and they wiped out those those islands way out there, you know, like St. Martin, I don't even know that there those countries are coming back. And my neighbor was down at Maria after Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. and he said... The death toll is like four or five thousand, but there's only one coroner on the whole island that can confirm wow. a death by the hurricane for the official count. And there's no way they're getting all these just bloated, dead, Mm-mm. rotten bodies to him. Yeah. So it yeah. it was thousands upon thousands. And he still yeah. goes back regularly to do work down there. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. I mean, I, I can't imagine. I know everybody wants to help the Bahamians, and we all want to see that come back, but it's going to take years and a lot of, you know, organized work. But I think with all of the outpouring of support uh, from the United States and elsewhere, that it's going to come back, but it's obviously never going to be what it was. My brother said there's going to be a, this is a time stamp. It's like before Dorian and after Dorian for the those islands. Yeah, it's like pre-Andrew and post-Andrew in it's, southern yeah. Florida. Yeah, or, you know, post and pre-Katrina for right. New Orleans. Yeah. So. All right. Well, on a, <laughs> a happier note, so you, you also mentioned you do some public speaking. So how did you get into that? 
Well, um, there are, like I said, a lot of fly fishing clubs here in Orange County. And um, uh, Marshall, his name's Marshall, and I, I hate, I'm terrible with names, and I can't remember his last name, and he's going to kill me. But he approached me about speaking um, on flats fishing for the clubs. And so uh, they actually invite a lot of speakers from around the country to come to Southern California to speak on, on and like tarpon fishing, uh, trout fishing, flats fishing, et cetera. And so you do the tour. I know Wanda Hair Taylor also did the speaking tour here in Southern California. So it's a basically a two week gig. And it was crazy balancing my job at Amgen and then at night doing a speaking tour. I felt like I had a dual life. <laughs> But um, it was a lot of fun, and I got to meet a lot of great people throughout California. I've learned when you go to these public speaking events, no more shaking hands. Really? Oh, I got a <laughs> bad norovirus or something. Oh, no. Someone at that That's snakehead talk has something on their hands, some poo germs <laughs> or something. <laughs> no, I just learned that, you know, every time there's a speaking gig, you get a good, a big dinner. And so by the end of it, I thought, God, I've gained like 10 pounds eating all this food. I'm so, going to come on the speaking tour out there. Talk about you should. Shad. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk to Marshall Bissett yeah. here. That's his last name. We're going to go all out to out. Uh, Sizzler afterwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or before. Usually they you eat dinner and then you speak. Oh, no, I did. My, so. my Trout Unlimited chapter, they take you uh -huh. to Outback Steakhouse. Uh -huh. And I know as, as a former, oh, still Aussie, it's it's not real authentic. I had some chicken fingers that may have had more salt in them than the Dead Sea. <laughs> and about oh. 20 minutes into my talk, I was starting to shrivel up. Like I could not speak. My mouth was oh, puckered. And I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, it was horrendous. And there was nowhere to get a drink. That TV oh, no. club used to have dollar beers when I was a kid. And then I turned oh, no. 21 and they stopped serving beer. <laughs> oh my goodness i that's when you have thirsty dreams you go to bed afterwards yeah no that's why i always carry a little bottle of water because you do get parched talking for over an hour right anything else california marsh saltwater flats i didn't um, cover i will i there's been this stigma i think in about against the keys and there's one thing i, I just want to say the Keys are a great place to go fishing. And, you know, there's you have the tarpon fishing in the spring. You also have great permit fishing down south to Key West. And everyone, you know, they say, oh, the guides are so tough on you. And to me, they're the best teachers I've ever had. Um, they teach me every time I go down there, I have an open mind and I learn something new. And I think it's well worth the, the money that people spend to go down there and learn how to flats fish essentially in one of the best places in the world to do that so it's just it's just something you know you don't always have to go to mexico you don't always have to go to belize sometimes you can just go to miami and drive down i and, could reach route one in about 15 minutes and then it's a mm -hmm. straight shot yeah and i i wish that i live closer you know instead of flying across the country to get to one of my favorite places in the world but uh, just to let people know not to be intimidated by it. It's a great place to be. Right. What are some of the other favorite places you fish? And what, we didn't talk about Steely Chick. Oh, Let's get Steely Chick or favorite places? Okay. We'll do both. Yeah, Steely, when I first um, started, you know, opening my mind, because I was a trout angler, and I remember catching uh, a fish on Lake Crowley, which is um, north of Los Angeles on the eastern Sierra, and seeing this fish tail walk across the water and put me into my backing. And I looked at my guy, I said, are steelhead like that? He said, absolutely. I said, well, I want more of that. I'm tired of these tall, these small puny fish. And so he took me steelhead fishing on the Rogue River. Ooh. And and it was so much fun going down a drift boat. And granted, it was cold. It was like October, November. But just getting those fish going into your backing was great. And then I had to have more of it, but I couldn't afford it, so I took up ocean fishing. So this is where I got Steely Chick when I first went on Instagram. I was hunting steelhead. But then it became more of like me not giving up against tarpon and people like, oh, you've got a lot of steel in you. So <laughs> my other moniker at work is Honey Badger. But, uh, <laughs> Honey Badger is a given Exactly. I'm just going to get out there and kick your ass. So, you know, that's where I, I kept Steely Chick. 
All right. See, I love Steelhead too. I just live in the wrong place. Well, do you go up to New York or yeah, we're any going of the... up again mid November. I would love to get uh -huh. up winter, but yeah, well, I'm a stay at home dad with the I work seven days <laughs> a week either in the house or on the water. I just don't have time to go gallivanting yeah. around. Gallivanting. Uh, some, I always say, and granted, I'm spoiled. I don't have kids, so for babies, yeah. You know, yeah, well, not even that. I even got rid of those to free up my time even more because I used to have two horses, you know, two cats and an aquarium, so I could never go anywhere. But now it's just me and, you know, wherever I want to go. My neighbor, so. Lawn Guy, uh -huh. he apparently gave away the family dog the other day when the kids went to school with no warning. Oh, wow. Just straight up got rid of the dog. Gave it oh, away no. when they went to, like, first day of school. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> We call him Lawn Guy because he'll spend 10 hours a day, all weekend, 10 hours a day on his lawn. They're never outside. Think... They don't enjoy it. I think I remember the guy who always had his window open. Yes. That was, that was the <laughs> that old the neighborhood. Now we've got, oh, okay. well, we've got Lawn Guy. we got the abandoned frat house with the toilet out front. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. big question is, can you DNA someone's poop? Oh, ah. Because if it's sitting there, everyone's just going to go. <laughs> it's been sitting on the front stoop for a month. And then oh, the neighbor so house behind us, I had a bunch of people over after one of the nights at the pool. They were in the backyard, uh -huh. and the light came on. And I was like, shh, that's the fifth uh -huh. time that light's ever come on. us. Like, everyone come out and look. Because <laughs> I cut all the bamboo down between our two houses, and you can see it. In oh, no. four summers, uh -huh. we've seen the light on four times until that night. Oh, that's eerie. And that's then really eerie. My old neighbor, Jan... <laughs> She says that window is still open sometimes in the old neighborhood. Uh, uh, but I'm not yuck. going back to Anna Dump to go check it out. No way. Yeah. Uh-uh. Okay. What was your other question? Other places to fish? Yeah. Other favorite. I think Placencia um, in southern Belize is another one of my absolute favorite places to fish. Um, it's outside of Belize City, and you're closer to Honduras and Guatemala. So it's a, a lot more remote. And the... The permit fishing is out of this world. So you'll get permit in the lagoons. And one morning we went out there, and I was just learning how to permit fish. But we must have had 20 permits swimming all over this lagoon. And it was like, you know, I had always been told, oh, you'll see one or two permit a day. And here I couldn't figure out which one to target. It's like a herd of unicorns all of a sudden. I know. It's like, what do I do? And he's like, pick the biggest one. I'm like, uh. So. That was a lot of fun. And then you go out to the coral reefs and you see the larger permit, you know, like 15 to 20 pounds. And that's, you know, that's another challenge unto itself because you can really see the entire fish. And you sometimes get really intimidated, but you just got to go for it. But, yeah, and I love Placencia. You, you fly in there. And when you fly in, you, it looks like you're flying on someone's, you know, driveway, but it's actually the, the landing field. And then, you know, there are a lot of nice restaurants. Everyone's friendly. And it's nice and quiet. And that's what, and, you know, when you go overseas, I don't want to go to another city. I want to be remote and, you know, where it's quiet and where I can hear myself think. Yeah, you live and, in the hustle and bustle. I can imagine yeah. quiet is a thing of you know, yeah. beauty to you. That it's, yeah. I love quiet. I'll just go in the shed and watch the news. Even if I'm <laughs> in my office, my wife and my kid and my dog will bother me. So I've just gone to the shed. There's no electricity or anything. I can just sit out there. Oh, I don't wow. even get Wi-Fi. I will just turn on. I'll be like, I'm going to watch 20 minutes of Anderson Cooper. Or I'm going to watch <laughs> whatever. That would not on. relax me. Watch I'd North start yelling Wood at Laws. the TV. Yeah. <laughs> just, I'll watch whatever just to get out of here. I thought my wow. office where I am now would be my, my safe haven quiet spot. But no. No. I lost that about a weekend. Oh, no. No. I guess you're right because I I was I'm looking at a picture of me holding a redfish in the marsh, and yeah I can already I can already hear the wind in the reeds, and how quiet it was. So maybe yeah maybe living in LA that's a thing for me. It has to be quiet. Yeah, we have an airplane every sixty seconds, twelve hours a day that comes overhead. Oh no. We're right on. <laughs> that's why our roof part of our roof is a piece of white vinyl shrink, uh, mm -hmm. whatever. And I would just uh -huh. want to write "Welcome to Baltimore" or "Welcome to BWI" on the roof. So people uh -huh. that fly over think they're they're on the wrong plane. <laughs> well, you can always get an announcer, you know, like, oh, welcome. I think we were on a flight to Nassau, and someone said, 
this is the flight to Cleveland, Ohio, and my friend and I just oh, freaked I out. Like, oh, my wife. God, we're supposed to go to Nassau. That's funny. Well, after 9-11, they stopped saying, like, if you look out of the left side of the plane, you'll see mm -hmm. Omaha, Nebraska. They used to announce that. Yeah, they, don't they do still do. They do? They Yeah, yeah. Like, we are be flying across the United States, and they always announce the Grand Canyon. But I guess, you know, that's hard to take out. I, I imagine <laughs> you would not need that announced. It's no, it's <laughs> I was like, what is that crack in the, in the earth? Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, I got some some random fishing, non fishing questions. Sure. What's your favorite modern fly fishing gear item? Mm, oh, good question. Um, now, now, now I can't even. I'm blanking out because I'm looking at my my T bar reel, but that's not necessarily you know the latest and greatest because it's a Gulf Stream with your name on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and a big that's tarp, cool. and I'm like, that's my favorite reel. <laughs> so, but modern. Um, Hmm. I guess I'm not a modern person. I love my Diablo kayak, which is a stand-up paddleboard, too, so I can go around my lake and catch bass. And I also have a portable, you know, handheld fish finder that I love to use by Hummingbird. So that's, no, it's um, by Garmin. Sorry, it's by Garmin. That's one of the things I really enjoy taking with me on trips if I have to do it myself on a kayak. And the cool thing about the Diablo is you're sitting up in a chair, Yes. Instead of your legs going numb with them sticking out, which I <laughs> despise in kayaks. I would say if I'm going to get another kayak, it's going to be the the Diablo with the seat in it. Yeah. No, it's so comfortable. And I also, you know, again, going back to tarpon and preparing, we have wind warnings out here, like Santa Ana winds. And I will always go out there on the lake, anchor out, anchor the stand-up cattleboard kayak, and then start casting into the wind. And to me, that's the best practice, and I'm glad I'm able to stand up in it um, because not only do you have to, you know, balance on it, but you, you know, you also targeting into the wind. Sometimes the wind gets so strong it overwhelms the anchor, and then I'm dragged across the lake. But <laughs> it's good practice. So Santa Ana is always made for a, a good script on the, the Baywatch episodes. <laughs> Every season, they'd yes. have the Santa Ana winds, and something strange would happen. Like CJ was hearing voices at <laughs> and uh, at Del Coronado hotel yeah. Coronado. yeah nice. all right uh, nope. if you had a, a superpower to make you a better fly angler what would you choose oh man i think i think being taller you know maybe you know go for 510 so i have more height to see more and then you know like um have 10 20 vision so i can really see you know or infrared so i can see in the dark nice. i think that would be really cool what's the worst place you've ever fished Oh, geez. It still would have, I mean, the best and worst. I think the L.A. River is still probably one of the most disgusting places at times that I've ever fished. There are some places on the L.A. River that I wish I had had brought a bottle or a gallon of Clorox just to pour over me. I'm always in my waders, but just to disinfect the waders and wading boots. <laughs> What's the strangest or funniest thing you found on the L.A. River? Uh, um, a friend of mine found a body. Um, but uh, that's like a nightmare scenario for me. I that's never want to find a body. Since Stand By Me, that's always been <laughs> – I told my client on Friday, we were wet waiting the middle Potomac, and they were giant log jams. I'm like, dude, we're going to find oh. a body just like that kid from Stand By Me. Yeah, but I will tell you a story. Um, you know, I used to fish Long Beach quite a bit, and you know, I'd go right before dawn, so it was still dark out. And I remember one day putting on my waders, grabbing my rod, and going across the beach, and there are all these – like like um, emergency vehicles on the beach and with lights. And I thought, Jesus, what's going on? I looked and I see feet in the sand. I'm like, oh, man, they found a body. So I tried to get away from that area. And then I kept looking at the area as I was fishing. And I noticed there were tents going up. I'm like, oh, my God, maybe it was more than one body. <laughs> and then I'm going by and I realized that they were doing a photo, like a, a film shoot for Dexter. Because they were filming yes, Dexter right. in that area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Marina Del Rey in Long Beach. Yeah, and I was like, ah, it was just a film set. Yeah, if you look on was... Dexter, you can see mountains in some of the scenes. Like, yeah, and no fog. Mountains in Miami. And and fog. I'm like, there's no fog in Miami. And yeah. even when they were filming, I'm like, that's my favorite halibut spot. And I would spot all my fishing areas. It's where so. Deb's house was located, probably. Yeah, exactly, right there. 
What would you tell someone that's just going to get into fly fishing? Or maybe what would you tell like a, a young lady who's getting into fly fishing? To have an open mind and not be discouraged. Um, and then to, you know, always have a, a, a woman mentor that they can trust and ask those, you know, quote unquote, dumb questions to. I teach a lot of young women, a lot of, you know, even older women who are interested in fly fishing. And it's great to have a group of women and then start discussing angling. And they're like, they always raise their hand and say, I have a really stupid question. And I'm like, there's no stupid question. And to ask those questions you're scared to ask, you know, in front of men, like, if I'm on a boat, where do I pee? And that's always a, that's always a question that's going to come up. Like, how do I go to the bathroom in waders? Like, well, you take them off, number one. The Patagonia and, ladies' waders were designed for popping a squat. Yeah. And the people just don't know that. And they're afraid to ask. And, you know, well, how do I tie this leader? And, you know, or, you know, my knots are so bad. Well, practice. And, you know, don't let other people discourage you from trying something new. It is going to be hard at first, but just keep at it. And usually when they catch their first fish, they're hooked, so to speak. Like I was when I was 10 up in Glacier, you know, I cast my first cutthroat and it rose and took the fly and that was it. You know, I was just hooked for life. If you had a time machine and (laughs) you could go back in time, let's say it's, uh, since you're in California, we're going to make it a phone booth with a antenna made out of an umbrella. Uh-huh. Uh, you could go back in time and fish somewhere that people hadn't destroyed. Where would you go back in time and fish a pristine environment? I would go back to the L.A. River. Fish I would, head. Yeah, I would love to see. I've always tried to imagine what it looked like with, you know, you know big snow in those mountains. Because even when I was a little girl, you know, Mount Baldy had 10 feet of snow on it at, at a time. And, you know, you the, the rivers, you know, what was it like with the fish in them, with the salmon, the steelhead? What was it really like? Because you look at the city now and you just see this huge expanse of concrete. And whenever I'm flying home or flying over the city, I try to imagine it as, you know, a bunch of ranches and the water in the spring and, you know, the antelope in those valleys and everything else that came with it. And, you know, what, what was it really like? And, you know, like I'm thinking of all the corbina on the beach, the tuna and the marlin in the ocean and what that must have been like. Yeah, we screwed everything up pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much everything's been screwed up. Like we could even have planes now if we had passenger pigeons still. There'd be no <laughs> flying. <laughs> right, because those were clouds and clouds of birds. Yeah. But yeah, I with just. The bison, those would take five days to pass by. Yeah, exactly. Back in the day, I mean, you had grizzlies and elk and mountain lions everywhere right. in LA. Right. It was and the we still, Serengeti we, of the West, basically. Yeah. Yeah. We still have mountain lions in my backyard. So we're still, we still have, I think, five lions. That's where your cats went. Yes, exactly. And, but yeah, you brought up the grizzlies. I mean, that's the state animal for California, and was they don't the live grizzly. There anymore. They're all gone. No, they're. They're gone, but you know, just to imagine that to me is just mind mind blowing. Uh, let's see. Who's your favorite fly fishing author? Oh boy, um, I gosh, you know the I'll have to look at my library right now. So hold on. <laughs> um, right, the guy Andy Mill, Andy a Mill. passion for tarpon, a passion for tarpon. It's a big book. Oh, it's a big book, but I loved how he approached it as a sport, you know, because he being an Olympic skier, he had a different mindset. He's and so he, he, he approached it like it was a sport and not just, oh, it's just fishing. And I thought that was a great way. And being a, a competitive horseback rider, and also I was a master swimmer, you know, taking that, you know, how to be an athlete for these big fish changed the way I thought about tarpon. And that, to me, when a, when a book sparks that type of epiphany, that's something you need to hang on to and, and really um, relish, because that's when your mind starts to think differently. And if you ever can't reach the table at a restaurant, you can always sit under it. Like when we were kids, we had phone books. Uh huh. This book's big yeah. enough to sit on and boost you up. I know. But it's great information. I mean, I always go back to it. And then also a passion. I think it's a passion for permit. Those two volumes. It's another great. Those are two great books. Do you have to put those on the bottom of your bookshelf so they don't fall through the shelf? 
I have so many books. I'm looking at it right now. And it's just, I had to have a bookshelf made for all of my books. Because essentially, you know, I was self-taught. There wasn't, when I was growing up, we didn't have social media. And I'd walk into a fly fishing shop and they're like, what does your dad want? So, you know, there, and I, maybe everyone, that was everyone's experience, but I grabbed every book, every magazine I could get my hands on to start feeding my brain about fly fishing and understanding techniques. I mean, I have volumes by Lefty Cray and all of that in my library. So. I love my fishing library. I just don't have room. Yeah. I'm yeah. probably getting rid of my aquarium so I can make room for more books. <laughs> I, like I said, I had to have shelves made just to hold all of these these volumes. And you, when you think about all those fishing magazines that we get, like fly fishing the Southwest or Eastern fly fishing and then tail and then fly fishing salt waters and all that information that's in there. It's just, it's a wealth of knowledge. All right. Next question. Are you ready for these? Sure. How do you take your in and out sandwich? Ah, oh, uh, I'm so boring. I like a double double, no onions. That's I'm so boring, but to me it's quick, and I know exactly what I'm getting. I, that's I'm boring. Um, I know I, but I liked animal style, but I'm I'm just the basic person. <laughs> okay. Uh, since we're on the topic of food, uh, hot dogs. You put ketchup or mustard on them? No, I put. Um, I put the country, the Dijon with the sauerkraut, and that's how I like it. So a big Hebrew national with the sauerkraut and the and the Dijon. You going to Costco for these? Mm, no, I buy them okay. and just make them myself. That sounds yeah. good. Uh, yeah. What sports team do you want to see win a national championship? Oh, God, the L.A. Dodgers. Best Harrison Ford movie? Um, the first uh, Indiana Jones. Do you have any superstitions, fishing or non-fishing related? No bananas. <laughs> and um, I don't wear the tournament um, shirts ever. Because to me, that just, for me, it, it just brings, you know, it'll just shut the fishing down. Okay. Every single time I've worn a tournament shirt, it's just shut the fishing down for me. So I just, Turkey I wear them sandwich, when I. No shirt. Yeah, and I just wear them when I'm running. I don't wear them fishing. Do you have any irrational phobias? Uh, millipedes and bananas on the boat. I mean, I will look through everyone's gear and make sure they don't have any banana boat sunscreen. Wow. <laughs> what is it? Is it just, the smell of millipedes? The cyanide just, that comes out or just, just the look? Just the look of those legs going every which way. It's just disgusting. <laughs> We were at a bar once. It was called Bar Pilar after Hemingway's boat. And this woman uh -huh. told a joke about a husband and wife, and they're putting the shoes on, and it was taking him so long. Uh -huh. She's like, what's wrong with you? He's like, I'm a millipede. Because he had to put on Gross. 50 pairs of shoes. We saw some uh -huh. big ones on Friday after we were, we were hopping islands on the Potomac River, and there were some five, six There's inch some... long ones out there. I remember how big those were in my backyard. In uh, Maryland, I was like, that's, I think, where that my disgust for millipedes came from because they smell, too. Yeah, cyanide. Ugh. And then there's yeah. the house centipedes, the clear ones, the uh, <laughs> uh, you're cro chylopod, you're chylopoda. Yeah. Those things are nasty. They're, like, translucent. And yes. When we have giant centipedes out here um, in the brush, and um, my friend's a photographer, and we were watching Kestrel's dive bomb for, for centipedes. I'm like, eat as many as you can because they're Please disgusting. <laughs> What's the one Ugh. food you won't eat? I, ah, oh boy, what was it? I think most Indian food, and I don't mean to be prejudiced. I just don't like all of the, the heavy curry. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God, if I could eat one type of food uh -huh. all the way. I mean, we made tandoori <laughs> chicken last week. And then the uh -huh. next night, I made tandoori chicken pizza. Mm -hmm. Oh, so good. <laughs> now, give me, you know, the California Pizza ki Kitchen Thai chicken pizza. I'm in heaven. Or the barbecue chicken pizza. I love that. So you don't mind cilantro? Not at all. I love oh. it. I relish it. Oh, I'm dry heaving. Just <laughs> Okay. We've established yeah. our boundaries. <laughs> What's your most played album? Um, Ghost in the Machine by The Police. Wow. Um, yeah, that's yeah, and especially "J'aurai toujours femme de toi." That's probably one of my my favorite songs. 
what's your drink? If you ever come over, I have to know what you drink. Um, I think it's bourbon and, and Diet Coke. Well, so you look to get faster in the system. <laughs> yes. What's your bourbon? <laughs> oh, gosh. Let me run and find it. I'm terrible, like I said, with names. So what do I – Whistle Pig. Well, no. Oh, that's, a, that's fancy yeah. stuff. New Hampshire. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I haven't uh-huh. had a Whistle Pig. In, my cousin brought some to Thanksgiving a couple years ago. It's so good. Yeah. Mm. And uh, let's see. Last uh, story, or last question. If you had a band, a live band, to follow you around and play a theme song behind you, what song would they play? Ah, oh, man. Ah, oh, geez. I used to have a theme. I think Voodoo Child by Jimi Hendrix. All right. I mean that that is my you know you wake you have a power song you always should play before you go power fishing like for tarpon and that's one of them that I always play because I, I love the riff on the guitar and all that energy behind it and then he has that chuckle like you know screw you and I love that. All right, I do have one final question now. I just thought of it. Sure, sure. Why you got to be posing with a rod on your shoulder? <laughs> well, at the time I was trying to get you know hatch their attention from Hatch. So it's always trying to show the reel off. Now I don't care, but you always get the guides who want to show off the reel. And so, you know, they, they always want you to have the fish across your knees if it's big enough and then have the reel. And so instead of hanging on shoulders, I'd start putting it underneath the fish, but obviously that would get a crotch shot, which I wasn't in favor of. So <laughs> you'd start putting the, the reel back on the shoulders again. You're not worried that that fish is going to flop and that rod's going into the drink? It, oh, it has. It totally has. But usually, the like Greg was very good. He knew how to balance that, that rod and reel really well. But um, now, you know, we get the larger fish, and they usually will put the, the, the rod and reel on the deck and then have the fish along that. So you just have the rod and reel somewhere in the photo. All right. Yeah. My clients <laughs> just drop the rods, and that's why my reels are all dinged up. No, 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 no. That, no. Some reels are works of, to me, reels are works of art. If they're, you know, done well and they function well, we talked the technology. About the boat. Yeah, that was a big yeah. talk in the boat the other day. Was, <laughs> they, we're going to buy a yeah. reel to make it last for years. Right. And it should last, like, when I met my boyfriend, he had six Mako reels with him. And I, I looked at him like, why in the hell would you bring six Mako reels with you on a party boat to outside of San Diego? He's like, that's just what I fish with. Fine. But they're designed to take a beating. So yeah. to me, they're works of art. Right on. Uh, where yeah. can listeners follow you on social media and see all your yeah. gallivanting adventures? <laughs> I think the best one is you know Instagram and Steely Chick. And then also you can follow me on Facebook under Kesley Gallagher. But Steely Chick is where I keep the stories going, and you can see me gallivanting around L.A. or wherever I'm going. I'm going off to Cincinnati next week. I might hit you know, some of the rivers out there, and then off to Sweden at the end of October. Very cool. Sweden yeah. and Cincinnati, very different. And Boston and New Hampshire. I forgot oh, wow. that. So Is that all through work or fish? It's it's working, and I always try to weave some kind of fishing in it. Obviously, Sweden in October, I have no idea, and I I'm not there long enough to figure it out. Oh, there's salmon but in I, downtown Stockholm, just through town. Yeah. Oh, now I now we need to talk. Yeah. So, talk yeah, to the wife. That would be. I'll get her. Old okay. Book. And then she can suggest <laughs> restaurants and stuff, depending on where we're going. Oh in yeah. Sweden. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for being on the podcast today, and uh, Thank- hopefully I'll get to fish with you in one of these awesome locations one day. Absolutely. When I come to visit FDA in Washington, I'll yeah. give you a ring. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. It was great. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com.
This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.